So, thank you, Ikwe. It's a real delight to be here. Uh, uh, I'm going to spend a fair amount of time uh, saying a little bit about uh, Osama Shimamura, a little bit about his life for maybe the people that don't know. But I wanted to point out that he actually wrote an autobiography. Uh, you see three names there uh, in this book, Luminous Pursuit. Uh, Osamu's name first, Sachi is his daughter, and uh, John uh, Renegar is uh, his son-in-law, married to, to Sachi, and uh, together they put this book together. It's really quite wonderful, and for the next several slides, I'm going to give you quotes that I found in the book that say a little bit about his life and, and what it was like. Uh, I want to we'll start off. Um, with his upbringing, he, uh, he, he was brought up uh, for some of the time by uh, his grandmother. And uh, from reading about it, it, it was a different upbringing than I think anyone in this room probably has had. There was some tradition in the family, uh, somewhere back in the family of samurai. And his grandmother apparently kept telling him about that when she was bringing him up. So he had a rather strict upbringing. And this is what he writes. He says, grandmother was extremely strict in manners of, and manners inadequate. So I always had to maintain good posture and in her presence. She liked to declare the samurai betrays no weakness when starving. And then he writes, after my bath, she would occasionally check behind my ears and neck. If she found any dirt, she would say that it would be ignominious when I had to be beheaded. Because it's sometimes honorable for samurai to commit harakari uh, and then be beheaded. So if you have a dirty neck, that's a disaster, obviously. And I knew she was emphasizing the importance of readiness, but her stern words were still a little scary. Yes, a little scary indeed. He then uh, was in middle school, high school uh, in uh, Nagasaki. And uh, when he was 16, he was told, you have to leave school, not graduate, because you have to work in a factory. The factory, as you'll see, was 10 miles outside of Nagasaki, and so on. August 9, 1945, he describes what it was like to live through the bombing of the town. He says, I saw a single B-29 going from north to south towards Nagasaki about 10 miles away and wondered because its course was unusual. The B-29 dropped two or three parachutes, but I could not see any people hanging from them. Actually, they were dropping monitoring systems to be able to take measurements after the atomic bomb was dropped. And then he saw the B-29 that had the atomic bomb uh, following the first one, and then the sirens sounded the all clear. We returned to our factory building, expecting to resume work. As soon as I sat down at the, uh, my work stool, a powerful flash of light hit us through the small windows. We were blinded and they'd be able to see anything for about 30 seconds. Then maybe, maybe 40 seconds after the flash, we heard a loud sound and felt a sudden change in air pressure. We were sure that a huge explosion had occurred somewhere nearby. The sky rapidly filled with dark clouds, and when I left the factory to return home, a drizzling rain had started. It was black rain, a mixture of ash, water, and nuclear fallout. 
When I arrived home an hour later, my white shirt had turned completely gray. My grandmother took one look at me and quickly ready to bath so that I could clean myself. That bath may have saved me from radiation poisoning. So she was good about that washing behind the neck, uh, I think, here. But uh, quite harrowing. Uh, eventually, he goes and finish, uh, doesn't really finish high school, he sort of finishes it, goes to the only college he could go to in the area around Nagasaki, which was the pharmacy school, because it was the only part that was open. He gets his undergraduate degree and then comes here basically to work as a technician. And he, as was said before, he works for Yoshimasa Harata, this hall is named after. And uh, Harada gave him a very interesting problem that really set the course of his entire life. During World War II, uh, there had been a massive collection of these small crustaceans called Cypridina. And uh, these uh, small crustaceans, you could dry them out, add a little water, crush them up, and they produced a blue bioluminescence. And no one had a clue how they worked or what the components were. And in particular, they needed to have, uh, it, there were no crystals of the substrate for the enzyme in, in this molecule. And several people had tried this, both here in Japan and in the United States, and everyone had failed. And uh, so that was the project he was given. Something we often do with the new people in the lab, give them a problem that no one has been able to solve and just hope that they're going to work. It's going to work. Uh, you can't really see that that test tube says Cipridina 1944. When I first met uh, Osamu at Woods Hole in uh, it's about 1993, he gave me this test tube of uh, Cipridina that he had, and it came from this enormous bottle that he had that was labeled Cipridina 1944, all these dried things. He still had it in his lab. Uh, in any case, uh, he is trying to figure out how to isolate this, the, the substrate, the luciferin for this bioluminescent process, and he decides he's failed at it. He, he thinks maybe it's going to have an amino acid in it or something. It's going to be something making up this small molecule. And so he decides to do a, a, a degradation into, a, a, if it's a small peptide, into the particular amino acids. And to do that, you had to incubate with acid. And he decides, he puts the acid in, and then it's too late in the day, he goes home, he'll do it tomorrow. He comes back and the solution, which was a dark red, is completely clear. And he looks at the bottom of the solution and there's crystals. He had, crystal, he had done what no one else had been able to do. He crystallized this thing and the reason was he had added acid that he did for a completely different reason. So an accidental discovery. He seems to specialize in accidental discoveries, but I want to, I'll make a comment about that. He comes to the United States, he goes to, uh, to Princeton uh, with, to work with Frank Johnston, who is a researcher there, on other types of bioluminescence. They do some stuff with Cipridina, and then they go to Friday Harbor Laboratory in Washington State, where they try to figure out how it is that this jellyfish, Aquaria victoria, is bioluminescent. And so, uh, and I, was, I got interested in this because I heard a seminar about this in 1989. But the work he did was in 1962. And he was trying to figure out how this jellyfish produced light. The only problem is every time he ground up the jellyfish, the resulting solution really didn't allow for purification and for the isolation of whatever it was that was producing light. And he was having a very hard time uh, doing these experiments and basically failed the entire summer. He bribed his kids, I think it was 
a hundred jellyfish for a penny or something like that to, to collect more and more jellyfish for him. Uh, but uh, eventually, uh, one night, the experiments have failed again. And I always like this as an example of the scientific method. He cleans up and he throws away the samples that failed in the experiment uh, into the sink, which had some overflow from some of the seawater tanks there. So there's some seawater in the tanks. And um, it's late at night. He wants to go home for dinner. He turns off the light, and he happens to look back at the sink, and the sink is glowing. And that had never happened before. And so he thought about that and said, oh, probably something in the seawater. What's in the seawater I've never added? Calcium. And so sure enough, as he redoes the experiment, he keeps adding calcium to the solution. I've heard of people that have gotten experiments to work by throwing things on the floor, sometimes just on the lab bench. It's not a really bona fide technique, but sometimes it works. In any case, he realizes that he can use this to purify the, the protein, which he does, and he names the protein after the jellyfish and calls it a quorn. And so a quorn plus calcium ion will produce a flash of light. And in fact, he has another paper after the paper announcing that he's purifying this that says, look, we can actually measure calcium by how much light is produced from this. Uh, and so he does this, except there's a problem. The light that's produced is blue, and the light that the jellyfish produces is green. So he knows there must be something else. There is no other calcium-activated protein that does this. But he finds, he, he thinks about it for a while, and he says, maybe there's a molecule that converts the blue light into green, or the energy for blue light into green. And so he goes with a handheld UV lamp, and he looks at all his samples again. And sure enough, there's another sample that when he shines blue or ultraviolet light on it, he gets this brilliant green light coming back. That's fluorescence. He writes in a footnote to his 1962 paper that uh, he has this protein, and he calls it the green protein. Uh, it became known uh, about 10 years later uh, as green fluorescent protein, or GFP, which is what we're here to partially celebrate as well. And so he realized that what you really need is to have a corin calcium to produce the light or the energy that would go into the production of blue light. But GFP then converted to green light. And I'm sitting in a seminar listening to this, and I cannot believe it. I, you have to realize, I come from a background where I work on this small worm, Centaurebdias elegans. The worm's transparent. And at the, that time, we were trying to figure out, or we were doing various methods, to turn on and look at gene expression in cells. And so I'm listening to a seminar where I'm told, look, there's a protein. All you have to do is shine blue light on it, and green light will come out. And I'm saying, I work on a transparent animal. This is going to work. This is going to be fun. I don't remember anything else about the seminar. I just fantasized for the entire time about what experiments we wanted to do. But it was very, that's got to be a little louder. OK. Uh, but it was very exciting because I realized that basically this was providing a lantern. It would light up anything that you could see in a cell. If it was made, you could see it in parts of a cell. If it was connected to a protein, it could maybe label the whole cell. There were so many wonderful possibilities. And so I got extremely excited about this. And uh, working with uh, Douglas Prasher, who was uh, isolating the DNA, the cDNA for, that encoded for GFP, uh, uh, we were able to work in my lab, show, show in my lab, that yes, we could put just the coding sequence for GFP, get it expressed in E. coli or in our worms, and we could see a fluorescent protein made. It didn't need anything else. It was a single components labeling system. And the basic idea is if you can see something, you can study it. And so this sort of blossomed out so that now we have lots of different organisms and cells that you can 
label with GFP. Down here in the lower left-hand corner is Alba, the GFP bunny. This was uh, an animal that was commissioned from a biotech company in France for the Brazilian artist now living in Chicago, Illinois, uh, Eduardo Koch, and he would bring Alba, that was a family pet, to his various art shows to get people talking about the connection between art and technology or art and science. To give you some examples of what we do at GFP in my lab, uh, these are the cells that we've been studying for way too many years. These are cells that sense touch in the animal, but we can now see them. And once you can see them, you can study them. And so we can look, uh, let me just try to point out, I hope, one cell. You see this cell body here, it has, it's a nerve cell. It has a process that goes up to the front. Well, we've found mutants in which now that cell is bipolar, sending a process forward and also towards the back of the animal. And so now we can look also for mutants that no longer are able to do that. So we can keep doing things simply by looking at the change. We can look for animals in which the cells, there's more of this particular type of cell or misplaced cells or different shape as you see here. And all of these allow us to investigate aspects of nerve cell development that we otherwise would not be able to easily uh, look at. Another thing that we're doing, and this takes advantage of the fact that after green fluorescent protein became a useful tool, that set off a sort of uh, gold rush to find other fluorescent proteins in other organisms, and now we have many different colors. The first came from coral, from Russian, some Russian uh, scientists. Actually, the first different color came from Roger Chen, one of the three of us that shared the Nobel Prize. Uh, Roger changed one of the amino acids and made a blue fluorescent protein. But people had not been able to find red until the Russian scientists remembered that they liked to go scuba diving, and when they scuba dove, they uh, would look at corals, and corals had a red fluorescence to them, so they isolated that protein. So we have used that to look at a phenomenon in the cells and in the animal. There's our cell, that little green dot, and these red dots here are the muscle in the animal. When the animal hatches, that cell is right next to those. But as the animal grows, the muscle sort of goes north, the cell stays there, and this light blue, which is part of the skin of the animal, sort of intervenes. And as a result, you get this separation where the green is separated from the red of the muscle. But we can easily look for mutants that don't have this so that now the cell remains next to the muscle as you see here. I should say something about the color code. You may have noticed that Osamu's name was in black. These people's names are in red. I, my color code is anyone that worked in my lab, their name is in red. Anyone whose uh, name is in blue is a collaborator. And anyone whose name is in black did something I wish I had done. So uh, GFP, uh, like almost any development, leads to many more developments. There's been uh, increase in fundamental knowledge and applications, trying to uh, look at various things, and then, then some truly unexpected things. So just to give you some quick examples of that, uh, Cliff Brangwin and Tony Hyman in 2009, looking at some proteins that were known to be in the cytoplasm of C. elegans, discovered that these proteins were not mixed, but they seemed to be separated, phase separated, they called it, uh, from the rest of the cytoplasm. They found a completely different organization of the cytoplasm that no one had realized. This is now becoming increasingly important as people have looked at this and trying to understand what this means, since many RNA uh, binding proteins, in fact, show this phenomenon, both in the cytoplasm and also in the nucleus. Researchers at uh, Mount Sinai Hospital in New York were looking at asking the question, how was the AIDS virus transferred from one cell to another? And looking in mouse cells, here's, whoops, here's one mouse cell here. You saw the 
virus particle move from one cell into this other cell. Normally when we teach undergraduates about viruses, we talk about bacterial viruses and we usually talk about them lysing cells and having this sort of explode everywhere. Well, if that happens, of course, you could probably make an antibody, scarf that stuff up, and you'd be able to get rid of the virus. But if it's being transferred from inside one cell to inside another cell, you got to think of a completely different way of looking at this. And my last example, the unexpected, is uh, some work that Bob Burledge did when he was at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. He made GFP, connected GFP with a promoter in E. coli, such that the gene would turn on and the E. coli would become fluorescent in the presence of the explosive TNT, which happens to be something that leaks out of landmines. And so he was finding a way to detect landmines, and he had a friend bury five landmines in a three by five meter plot of land. And then he went and sprayed the, the area with his bacteria and then went back and was able to find at night, using a UV lamp, where those landmines were. They were disconnected. They weren't in any danger to him, but they did have TNT. This, is, a, however, is still a work in progress. And the reason for that is it has a very high bar. You want this to be 100% no false negatives, right? You want it always to work. And I know of at least several, well, now actually several different groups that are working on this to try to be able to generate something that will accurately uh, detect uh, landmines, which, of course, injure many more innocent people than combatants in any thing of war. I want to do a couple more quotes from Osamu. Uh, the first one is about luck. And science, he says, I would think so far that my life is generally lucky. There seems to be more good luck than bad luck, with the Nobel Prize as the greatest of good luck. The effect of the Nobel Prize was huge. Our lives changed. The focus of my work shifted. However, I'm not sure yet whether it brought me good luck and happiness overall. In the past, I experienced great joy two times, both times arising from my scientific pursuit. The first occasion was when I succeeded in the crystallization of cyprodinoluciferin in 1956, and the second was when I found how to extract a corn from the jellyfish aquaria. It is always joyful when an experiment or undertaking has worked well, but those two times were especially so. I thought I was now in the group of real scientists and had the confidence to go ahead as a scientist. I was really happy. The Nobel Prize was good luck that gave me a great honor, but it was not good luck that gave me such joy and happiness. I think there's quite a lot in this quote. Uh, one is his modesty, this feeling of, am I now a real scientist? <laughs> you have to do things, that, that insecurity of, am I really up to the task, which I think many of us share. Uh, and what really gives him joy, a few more quotes about GFP, GFP and luck. He says, the discovery of GFP was a rare piece of luck that nature granted to humans. The luck occurred because I picked it up when it came before me. And I want to emphasize, I named this, uh, you know, accidental science or a scientific accidents. And he was very fortunate to have quite a number of these the three that I've mentioned. But it wasn't the accidents that were important. It was the fact that he picked them up, that he realized that he had something important and that he took advantage of it. Um, we often talk about the prepared mind. Uh, he certainly had that, and he knew how to use them in a wonderful way. I think most of the time, for many of us, I have many, too many examples in my own life where uh, if I only had been paying attention, there was some pretty interesting things going on and I missed them. Uh, but so I think it's luck, but it's luck that you pick up and take advantage of because you do enough experiments, you get the luck. And then he talked about scientific research. He said, I would like to emphasize the importance of learning from nature to obtain, to obtain new scientific knowledge. 
I prefer to do research that searches for the true foundation of things rather than trying to find applications and usage. It is often an unappreciated effort in the background. And because the field was not, meaning bioluminescence was not a well-studied area, it is lonely research. This is not my wish, it is a consequence. So you see, so he's sort of rueful here. He's, he's it's in a sense, a little bit regretting that here he spent his entire life to do this. And I, I'll tell you a little bit more on the same topic in a bit. But I want to point out that last year in the United States, um, in February, he died in October, but in February, the US Postal Service did bring out a whole set of stamps on bioluminescence, which I think was quite nice. But I, I mentioned that, that he had a regret, and I think this is something that uh, I think I partially share with him. He says, it appears that all the lectures I gave and awards I received since 2000 were contingent on the discovery of GFP, which was incidental to my main field of research, bioluminescence. It makes me sorry, in a sense. It is somewhat disappointing to me that my attempts to open up the field of bioluminescence have been eclipsed by the prominence of GFP after I had specialized in the chemical research of bioluminescence and had made it my life's work for half a century. Yet, this is the reality of the world in which I live. When he got the Nobel Prize, uh, the reporter said, how do you feel? And he said, this has ruined my life. Uh, but I think there is this thing, you know, that there is something that, you know, you get an award for, and you do a lot of other work, um, and there's a lot of other things that you're interested in. I think it's, I, I, I can certainly recognize this since GFP took, uh, involved stuff in the lab for about two years, and we were doing quite a number of other things before, during, and after it that I'm also very proud of. So I can understand this feeling that uh, he had, I think a little bit more than most because he was working basically alone in all of this. So thank you very much.